think it's the hardest bit, getting up here, actually, when you're short. I must remember that. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting us. Well, indeed, we're going to be a double act. So hopefully we've done a bit of a test on the microphone, and hopefully you'll be able to hear us wherever we are in terms of speaking. So my name is Faith Gibson, and I work at Great Ormond Street Hospital and London South Bank University, and I am a full-time researcher. And the kind of things I research will be become clear in a second. And my co-partner for today and many days is... Ginny McIntyre. Um, my son had ALL when he was 13, which is actually eight years ago now. Um, and as Susan said, I've worked with CCLG sometime, um, various aspects, and also worked with Faith um, on her research as well. So. OK, so what we're going to do is we've got some slides which are going to be my focus, and then we're going to have some questions we're going to ask each other. And we've prepared this together, so it should seamlessly flow from one to another. But bear with us um, if it doesn't. Um, and hopefully we'll have time in the panel uh, for some questions. We're talking about sharing complex information with children, and we want to really focus on us as professionals and parents working together. And the first slide indicates what we're talking about in terms of working together, because actually you can see there's quite a group of us here working. And that includes the statistician, uh, other nurses, Nick Golden, who's leading the ALL study, uh, Moore Horseman, who's child development, Ginny, and Neil, who's in the audience, who's prepared to uh, speak up at any point if he feels we're not doing the job adequately so there's a range of people involved but what we want to do today is to do two things really um, is to share our communication studies with you as evidence of how we're seeking to understand how complex information is shared with children and young people um, evidence of how we're working with parents to understand the role they play in communication but also consider the role of professionals as we see it in this kind of shared role working with parents and the second part of today is really to talk about how we can do that together and the strength of the work that we've done so far, I believe, and hopefully that will become clear to you, is because we are working together in terms of uh, all the way through the research cycle. But today we'll also focus on some of the challenges that we may have faced, and we may not have necessarily resolved all of those challenges. And what we're going to do to, uh, to do it is to talk about a programme of research and we're going to break all the rules about presenting because I'm really not going to give you very much information about any of these studies. And We might have one slide which tells you what we did and then the second slide which will tell you about the findings and the middle section, the middle of the sandwich, will, become, will be empty to you in the audience. Um, but a lot of this work has been presented elsewhere and in publications so you can find the middle section but hopefully the way we'll do it you, you will understand when we get to the findings even though you don't have the middle section of the sandwich if that makes sense so it'll become clear as we go through um as for the important point i want to make here is that this program of research, just like there are clinical studies that may go over time or we answer different parts of a story, for us in terms of communication, there's a jigsaw we're trying to build. And we've been trying to build this jigsaw since 2004. And here we are in 2012. And what you see here is all of the studies that we've been doing since 2004. And they've been funded by these bodies down here. Here. And this is what we're going to talk about today, just passing through in terms of showing how we can build up and put pieces into the jigsaw as we move along. We're going to start with this study at the top, started in 2004, which was um, listening to children's study. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that and then uh, a little bit about some of the others. Uh, uh, studies as we go along. So this was a study, as I said, that was funded by Macmillan, and our key question here was what are the perceptions of children and young people with cancer regarding their care <coughs> and support needs? And in this study, we only spoke to children. This was in three centres, and we spoke to 38 um, uh, young people, and they were aged 4 to 19 years. And what we did in this study is used a range of participatory methods that include things like drawing and puppets to enable children to have a voice, uh, particularly for the younger children children where it's much more difficult to find out using interviews and we wanted to map the needs from their perspectives we want to think about the service what was uh, good about the service what was maybe less good about the service and we also want to think about developmental work about how we communicate with children and people using these particular methods such as puppets and things so that was our study and this is what we found so I'm skipping straight along to one um, 
one finding. What you see down the side here is not from our work, it's from other people's work. And what they've identified is that parents have some key roles, and many of the audience may be able to see some of these things, so that you become a communication buffer, that you're between the professional and your child, trying to find out information that then you can translate for your child and relay to your child that parents become the human database, and we see this particularly with um, young people where we ask them a question and they say, I don't know, ask my mum, ask my dad. They know the answer to those things. Um, so there's a range of roles that families fulfil, but in our study, what we were able to identify is communication was different across the age range. So what we identified was that for the younger children, and here I'm going to talk about children sort of under um, 10, but one of the things we do want to emphasise, one of the things that myself and Ginny have talked about quite a lot, is that age is not particularly helpful when we talk about communication. You might want to ask us about that later. But what we found in our study is that communication with the younger age group of children was directly from their parents. So it was parent to child, and you'll see that's why we've got a solid line. And the dotted line indicates that this route of communication was less. There wasn't very much going here, but there was a lot going here and a lot going here. And that was what we talked about in that. It's about parents in the foreground, very much at the forefront. And then when we moved on to talk to uh, young people older than that, it changed so that communication in the young person became stronger here. And there was a dotted line here for some of those uh, families. And we talked there about parents being in the background. So that was a key communication finding in our study. And so I've just chosen some of the quotes here to help you to see where that came from. So we asked children, has anyone told you um, you don't have to have medicines anymore? Mummy. Did anyone at the hospital tell you? No. Now, that's their perceptions. Now, this is not, hopefully you won't take this as us being critical of professionals. This was children's perceptions of what happened. And then one young man over here says, they could ask me if I have any questions. And his thoughts were, they always ask my mum and dad and they don't ask me directly. They could say, why don't you hold her hand? Mummy was just sitting there not knowing what to do. So children are already picking up on how we might help their parents. Um, I particularly like this one over here. Mummies are always right. Who do you talk to when you're upset? Mummy. Who else do you talk to? Daddy. And in fact, the continuation of this was when we asked, do you talk to a doctor or a nurse? And they go, no, I don't have any friends there. Um, so clearly, this is the communication pathway. I want to move on just to think about the older age group, and I just had some questions I wanted to ask Ginny at this point, is that if we had these speech bubbles here and we were talking to Ginny in that study, which we didn't, um, so I've got three questions. So starting with the first one, if we'd asked Alex, what do you think he might have put in his speech bubbles in terms of communication? Right, well, I think bearing in mind that Alex was 13 when he was first diagnosed, one of the things he would say was actually, um, can you speak directly to me? I'm not a little child, may I deny contact with me and actually talk directly to me, don't talk over my head. Um, the other things that um, come to mind are, tell me the truth, I'm not stupid, you're keeping something from me, I want to be talked to directly and I want to know exactly um, what's going on. Um, and also, also, the timing I think is important as well. Um, Professionals need to sort of understand when it's good for a child to, to know things and when actually they can see that they've actually taken on too much and they can't take on anything um, anymore at that particular time. So my next question was, what was the pattern of communication between you and Alex and professionals? Remember in those pictures, it showed that there was a kind of solid line between the young person and professional and then it was a dotted line to parents. Was that your experience? Um, in fact, my experience, I have to say, was very good. Um, we were at um, St George's when he was first ill, and in fact, he was extremely ill. Um, and several of the doctors were extremely good at um, relating straight to Alex. They'd, he, at that point in time, wanted to know everything. He wanted every drug to ex be explained to him. He seemed to be able to take it all in. Um, and so the communication, actually, the lines were very good for him. And was there anything, because we're going to go on in a second to talk about what we are creating between us that might help uh, parents, was there anything at this time you think would have helped you in terms of communication, communicating with professionals? Um, one of the things that really strings, uh, springs to mind is actually everything that was said to Alex and to me was always done in front of Alex. 
and as I'm sure you all know, there are some things that actually I would have liked to have known with him not being in the room. There were lots of questions I wanted to ask, and I never feel able to because obviously I didn't want to frighten this 13-year-old boy. Um, so some time alone with the doctor would have been really helpful, um, and um, I don't think they took that into consideration. Thank you. Um, and so what we took from that, and in fact you could also take from what Ginny was saying, is that parents have a key role in primary, being the primary communicator with young people as well as with children. And what we're going to focus on now is much more about children younger than 10. And that led us to think as a group of professionals, then how can we better support um, how can parents be better supported? Because it, we started to think, how well do we prepare parents for this role? Um, bear in mind, when parents join us into a, a cancer unit, they know, you know very little about cancer and the kind of world they're moving into. And yet we know quite a lot about that world. We could help much more over here. So we started to think about, so how can we um, support, professional, uh, support parents more in terms of our role as professionals? And so at the time, what we were thinking was what would strengthen our work, and it made perfect sense for us to then think about working with parents, um, bringing parents to join us as researchers, co-researchers, and to join us on our research team. And what we were helped with at this time, which you've already uh, heard uh, mentioned this morning, is this whole notion of patient and public involvement. So at the same time as we were thinking we would like to invite parents to join us, uh, this came along, so we had lots of things to help us. We had the brilliant work of Involve, no doubt about it, lots of guidance to help in, us in this kind of work. And the notion that actually parents can be involved at all stages, all young people for that matter, if you're working with the teenage population. And then even at the ethics application stage, which we've heard mentioned already, you are asked about patient and public involvement. So we're thinking we've got a good vehicle here to enable us to do uh, what we want it to do. So we just want to talk a little bit about that for us as um, people working together. And we're going to start off uh, with Ginny asking me some questions. So, <clears throat> Faith, why did you um, ask parents to join you on your study? So in addition to what I've just said, the key thing for us, I think, was that it would keep us mindful of what the role of the parents is in a cancer unit. And I think even as a professional, even though you've been in the field for many, many years, actually you have a perception as a professional and parents bring a very different perception. And for us it was about how can we combine those two together to strengthen the kind of work that we're doing. And I think if I think back, fundamentally, that was, that was where we started from, really, definitely. Now, Ginny, I just want to ask you, and then Neil, if he's got anything to contribute here, can I ask you what you think you contributed to the study before we go on and say a bit more about some of those studies? Well, I think we bring to the study um, a parent's perspective, um, and certainly um, Neil and I have been through this cancer journey with our children, and we've come out the other end. Um, so we can slightly stand back and look back on our experience and give the good and the bad of things that happen to us and bring that to the, the research table. And, and just thinking, can you say something about what you actually did? Because some families might think, well, what, what would you do in the research study? How did you, what kind of things did you do with us? Well, we've been very actively involved. Um, Neil does a lot on the phone and um, in the internet. I um, have more time on my hands, so I'm able to go to a lot of the meetings. Before the questionnaire was actually built up, we both spent a long time um, speaking to one of the um, um, face colleagues, Stephanie, um, who spoke to us both about our experience when we were informed of our children's diagnosis and how we coped and how we told our children. And I think what we said um, impacted on how they formed the questionnaire to conduct the research. Um, and, um, well, we've also, um, when we've actually... Um, you were forming the, the help that you'll go on to explain. Mm -hmm. um, l quite a lot of things that we were able to contribute, like what had helped us, um, various um, written information, um, leaflets, um, internet uh, sites that had helped us, I think then helped you mm -hmm. in forming your, your pattern of help that we're going to talk about in a minute. And, and what's often talked about is, is information leaflets and people say about the importance of involving uh, families, uh, parents and children. And actually that's hugely important because we have got it wrong um, 
on occasion, surely not all the time, but on occasion we've got it wrong and we've been helped to have the right words and I think that's really important in terms of the work. I'm just going to move on to think about the, the other studies and then we'll just say a little more about how we've worked together. So our second study uh, was uh, funded by Dimbleby uh, Cancer Care and in that study what we want to do is to investigate more the roles of parents and professionals, how they work together. In that study we interviewed, we followed a group of parents over time, uh, so that's six families over a year and then what they did is they identified a professional that they wanted us to talk to to find out about how that communication had worked and then we talked to many other professionals so in this study we only talked to parents and professionals we didn't talk to children so you can see we started to build up um, a slightly um, more pieces into the jigsaw I suppose and at that point we already knew that one of the things we wanted to do was to have something that would help I asked Jenny about what would help and we're thinking some kind of intervention something that we might put in place to help that communication based on what families um, have told us um, and just to give you one piece of that jigsaw, what we found in there, this is only one part of the story, which is about roles. And I was thinking a little bit about that through the course of the morning, the roles and identities, the roles we play as a professional and a parent. Um, and it's the kind of information about how we share that with families, about how, how these different roles play out in an environment, so that there are many things that potentially parents don't know when they join us, and how then we help them to understand more of those things over time rather than rushing in to give lots of information uh, initially. Um, and there's a lot around the structure of the roles about who gives information, about where information is. And it was very clear that we have information in different places and how can we help people to really know where to go for different kinds of information. And this is just how we build up the story in terms of findings. That, believe it or not, um, led us to help and we're going to talk a little bit more about help but before we do that I just want to mention one more study uh, which will add into the story so we've now gone back <coughs> to talk to children and in this particular study we're interested in finding out uh, what do children know about their their cancer their treatment and, and what's happened to them how they come to know um, to reveal the best way to communicate with children. So we were adding in another part of the jigsaw. And this is to inform good practice, but it's also to inform our intervention, which we're going to show you in a second. And we're doing that slightly differently in that we're observing interactions between professionals, parents and children, and that's following seven children um, over time. I've got my eye on the clock, but actually we start at ten minutes late, <laughs> so I think we're fine. Um, and this is what... Um, help looks like. What help will be is a web-based intervention kind of instrument for families and it will be made up of a number of different things such as short summaries, we maybe have some videos so we might have a parent like Ginny or Neil giving us some information over here, we might have some diagrams, we're going to have a discussion board. So together what you'll have is bringing together all the information that families might want only focusing on children with acute lymphoblastic leukaemia with the intention is we'll try out this help, if you like, this up here, and see if it works. And if it does work, then we should roll it out with other family members. And you won't be able to read that, but that's kind of what it looks like. And this is where, and I can remember sitting around a table with Ginny, when we worked out what some of these boxes might look like, about the kind of information that's already there. But all of this comes from the data. These are things that families say they want and how we can give them more information. This is the pathway of care along here, and that eventually you'll be able to click on these boxes and find some information. All this information here below comes from parent stories or podcasts or children talking to us. So this is help, in essence, um, and that's what it uh, will look like. Um, and we're going to try this out over three years to see if it works or not. So this is our last slide, and it's to think about going back to that contribution, um, really. Um, and I suppose it's, um, and I think Ginny was going to start off by asking me a question, weren't you, about the contribution to these particular studies. Yes, I mean, what do you feel that us parents have actually helped you in, um, in your communication studies? Um, I think if you, you know, if we go back to, you know, um, that, I'm not sure that all of that detail would have been there. I've said some of that came from data, but I think you helped us around the table to really think about where these things would be. So what will happen is, as you click on boxes, boxes will appear and disappear. And I think that's quite helpful to think about how you stage information over time. And that's where Ginny's been particularly helpful because she was around the table, helping us to see the kind of information you might want up front and what you might want 
want to come back to later. So I would say that's been really uh, uh, very important. Um, and Ginny, can I ask you, on reflection, is there anything that could have made your role easier on the team? Just thinking about your role and what you've contributed. Um, well, no, I think um, you... Um, I can't think of anything that I could have... Um, you could have made anything easier, to be honest. I think it's... Uh, you've always involved me in everything. Um, and um, I know underneath you said, do I feel valued? And I certainly... In, in every aspect and everything I've been involved in, I've always been listening to, um, which um, and felt that I you've acted on the things that are and included on the um, my suggestions and things I've added. So definitely, Neil, would you add anything? Yeah, I agree with Jenny. I felt certainly felt valued, and it's good that um, you know that I never attend any of the meetings. It's good that I could still contribute mm. by email mm. over yeah. the phone. But it's good. Yeah, I certainly felt I've been listened to. Yeah, I think that's an important point that it's not face to face and that actually for parents in the audience who are thinking how you do contribute and about how onerous that could be because we can make it much more flexible. But we did just want to mention one last thing which was about training and Ginny asked me about you know, training. We did make some available at the beginning and I don't know that we've necessarily got that right <coughs> and there are organisations that offer training such as Macmillan offer training um, but I think it's something we constantly should think about because actually it's understanding what parents want to contribute and what training they might need to be able to contribute not necessarily us as researchers thinking what might be helpful because uh, Ginny was reminding me of one of the sessions that she went to which was yes I did go to one of, um, which was about um, research and although I've done um, a paediatric degree and, and understood quite a lot of it I felt slightly out of my depth and possibly that wasn't the best um, venue for me to have gone. But Faith is now talking about doing in-house training and I think it's very important that it is offered because it is sometimes rather daunting. I mean, I came with some medical experience, but if you don't, you're still very valued. Um, but I think it's rather very nice to actually be given that bit mm. of um, Yeah, training. I think we'll do in-house mm. training. Um, and I think that was all we want to say. So it is a kind of... Um, Whistle stop a long, you know, over a long period of time. The research, um, and we, what you'll notice at the beginning, I didn't talk about parents being involved in the first study, and, and I think now we are at this point that actually I can't see any other way of moving forward with any of other our other programmes of research that parents will always have a key role, or young people if they are of that age to join us. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you.